Walk into a medieval building that's still standing, and, well, the shock hits immediately. Stone, sure. That's expected. But then you notice the wood. Roof beams, doors, structural frames. Timber that should have surrendered centuries ago is still doing its job. Not cracked, not rotten, not soft. And here's the uncomfortable truth modern builders don't like to admit. Medieval craftsmen, working without pressure-treated lumber, plastics or chemical preservatives, routinely produced wood that outlived empires. This wasn't luck. It was a system. A quiet, methodical, anti-rot strategy that turned ordinary trees into something close to immortal. This is the story of that system, stripped of romance and laid bare for serious history minds and, you know, modern survivalists who actually want to use it. Medieval durability began before the first cut was ever made. Longevity started in the forest, not the workshop. Medieval builders didn't treat trees as raw material waiting to be exploited. They treated them as living systems that had to be harvested at the exact right moment. Timing wasn't a preference. It was the foundation of everything that followed. Trees were cut in late winter or early spring, when sap levels were at their lowest. Sap is sugar-rich moisture, and sugar feeds fungi, bacteria, and insects. Less sap meant less internal food for decay. This single decision dramatically reduced rot before the wood ever touched a tool. Oak, pine, spruce, and other durable species were chosen not just for strength, but for how predictably they aged when treated correctly. If you're cutting your own wood today, this still matters, you know. Fell trees in winter if you can. And if you're buying lumber, look for slow-grown timber with tight growth rings. Fast growth equals weak structure and higher moisture retention. Medieval builders knew this without, well, microscopes or moisture meters. After cutting, nothing happened quickly. Timber was stacked off the ground, spaced for airflow, and left alone. Not for days, not for weeks, sometimes for years. Air drying allowed moisture to leave gradually, hardening the fibres evenly from the inside out. This prevented internal stress, which is what causes warping, splitting, and those tiny cracks where rot begins. Modern shortcuts use kilns and heat. Medieval builders relied on time. Heat dries wood fast, but traps stress. Time relaxes it. If you're building a shed, a raised bed, or, say, outdoor furniture, don't rush this stage. Store lumber in the shade with plenty of airflow, and, you know, keep it off the soil. Let gravity and time do their work. The difference really shows up five years later, when one project collapses and the other doesn't even flinch. Once dry, medieval craftsmen introduce fire, but not the destructive kind. Controlled surface charring was actually quite common, especially on wood exposed to soil, weather or insects. Light charring carbonized the outer layer, sealing the pores and making the surface, well, inhospitable to fungi and bugs. Carbon is hydrophobic. It repels water. It also denies insects a foothold and starves microbes of oxygen. The interior wood stayed strong and flexible, while the exterior became, you know, armour. This wasn't decorative. It was practical.
posts, beams, bridge supports, roof elements and structural joints were often charred where failure would be catastrophic. You can do this today with a propane torch. Blacken the surface until it's uniformly charred, not burned through. Let it cool. Brush off loose soot. What's left is a natural protective shell that outperforms many modern treatments, especially when combined with oil. Charring alone slowed decay. Oils stopped it in its tracks. Medieval builders saturated timber with natural substances like pine tar and resin-based oils. Pine tar wasn't paint. It was protection. Thick, sticky, and deeply penetrating, it soaked into fibers and stayed there. Pine tar is antifungal, antibacterial, insect-repelling, and water-resistant. It doesn't seal wood like plastic. It nourishes it. Multiple coats were applied over weeks, allowing absorption instead of surface buildup. The result was wood that could breathe without drinking water. For modern use, pine tar mixed with linseed oil or tongue oil works beautifully. You know, just warm it slightly so it flows. Then rub it in aggressively. Pay special attention to end grain and joints where moisture sneaks in. Let it cure. And really reapply when the wood looks thirsty, not on a calendar schedule. This treatment works on fences, garden beds, outdoor furniture, sheds, and even tool handles. It's messy. It smells. But it lasts. Here's where medieval intelligence really flexed. Even perfectly treated wood fails if water is allowed to sit. Medieval builders designed structures to shed water instinctively. Flat surfaces were avoided, boards overlapped, joints were angled, pegs replaced metal fasteners that trap moisture and corrode. Wood was allowed to move. Expansion and contraction weren't fought, they were accommodated. This prevented cracks that invite rot. You know, you can actually apply this today by angling horizontal surfaces just a bit. Overlap boards like shingles and, well, always leave a little breathing room. Make sure to elevate wood off the ground whenever possible. Really, even an inch can make a difference. A raised garden bed that drains properly will outlast one that traps water, even if both are made from the exact same wood. Now, let's layer it all together. Winter harvested wood, slow air drying, surface charring, deep oil saturation, and of course, thoughtful joinery. This is exactly how medieval builders created timber that survived floods, freezes, insects, and honestly, centuries of neglect. This is why medieval structures still had usable wood after industrial cities burned, after World War II bombing campaigns, after modern buildings failed decades sooner. The materials weren't magic. The process was disciplined. Build a shed this way, and you're not making a weekend project. You're making something your grandchildren could still be using. Store firewood this way, and it stays dry for years. Furniture treated this way doesn't need constant repair. This isn't nostalgia. It's applied historical engineering. Medieval builders weren't mystical. They were observant and, well, ruthless about results. Nothing here relied on superstition. Medieval craftsmen watched what rotted and what didn't. They adjusted. They remembered. Knowledge passed through hands, not books. 
Failures weren't tolerated because collapse meant death, not inconvenience. Modern building often prioritises speed, cost and disposability. Medieval building prioritised survival. If you're a history enthusiast, this is, you know, a reminder that technological advancement doesn't always mean improvement. If you're a survivalist, this is proof that low-tech doesn't mean low performance. These techniques still work because, well, physics hasn't changed. This knowledge is meant to be used, not just admired. Apply one method and you get improvement. Apply all of them and you get durability that feels honestly a bit unfair. You don't need chemicals. You don't need modern coatings that peel and trap moisture. You need patience, fire, oil and, of course, smart design. That's the medieval anti-rot secret. Not a single trick but a system that respected material reality. If this kind of deep historical knowledge matters to you, if you want skills that outlast trends and tech cycles, make sure you're subscribed to History HQ. Share this with someone who still believes modern always means better. And, well, keep learning because the past still has a lot to teach those willing to listen.